Praise the Lord. I said, Praise the Lord. I welcome you to our Tuesday leadership development session tonight in Jesus' name. I'm asking the Lord that He will bless you, enrich your life, and make you the kind of leader that He wants you to be in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this hour. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Your word that will strengthen us, that will enlighten us, and to lead us the way we ought to go. We're asking, O oh Lord, everything you reveal, you will store in our hearts in Jesus' name, and your work will prosper in our hands. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Tonight we're looking at First Peter chapter 5, verses 1 to 4. First Peter chapter 5, verses 1 to 4. In verse 1, the elders which are among you. I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly. Not for fear the looker's sake, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory. A fetus not away. Those verses introduce us to the commission and the duty as well as the responsibility of the Christian leaders and this commission is no mean assignment. It's a glorious duty that has eternal value with great rewards. All of the great and good responsibilities that terminate here on earth have limited earthly benefits. Think about the good things you can do on earth and the great callings we have on earth, natural, physical, just in the community. All of those things, no matter how great they are and no matter how good they are, they terminate here on earth. But this commission we're given, this great privilege we have, is greater than all those earthly assignments. If there is any conflict between the heavenly commission and the unearthly career, we should never drop the heavenly for the earthly. If the heavenly is the greatest, if the spiritual scene is the greatest, then whenever there is any challenge, any conflict between this heavenly assignment and the earthly responsibility, like many people do, we shouldn't drop the heavenly responsibility. On the other hand, we know that is the lesser opportunity that will go because the heavenly one far outshines and reaches farther than the earthly the heavenly vision must always take priority over earthly dreams tonight as we look at these verses one to four the message is the most ex exalted commission of Christian leaders. 
the most exalted commission of Christian leaders. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the calling and character of faithful, fervent leaders. The calling and the character of faithful, fervent leaders. Point number two, our commission and commitment to freely feed the Islam. A commission and commitment to freely feed the lambs. Number three, the compensation and the crowning of focused, fruitful leaders. The compensation and the crowning of focused, fruitful leaders. Coming back to point number one, the calling and the character of faithful, fervent leaders. Look at those two words, faithful. We have to be faithful to the calling the Lord has given us. And we have to be fervent as we carry out the work. The word of God tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful, that a woman be found faithful, that a leader be found faithful. We must be faithful to the calling the Lord has given us. And we must be faithful to the commission he lays quietly upon our shoulder. The responsibility and the duty we must do it with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and be faithful. Romans chapter 12, verse 11. In Romans chapter 12, reading from verse 11, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. As we're serving the Lord, in whatever capacity has called us, we must be fervent. We have an example of fervency in ministry in Acts chapter 18. Reading verse 25. Fervent minister, fervent leader, fervent preacher, fervent teacher. It tells us in Acts 18.25, this man was instructed in the way of the Lord, being fervent in the spirit. We're not sluggish, we're not dull, we're not weary, we're not walking and laboring as if we want the work to come to an end. We're tired, we're weary, we want uh, to go on sleep. It says Apollo was fervent in spirit. He spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. Even though he was limited in knowledge, limited in understanding, limited in experience, limited in training, yet he was still fervent, faithful and fervent. How much more? Those of us who have met the Lord and those of us who know all the benefits of Calvary and we know the commission and the calling he has given us the calling and the character of faithful, fervent leaders. Let's come back to First Peter chapter 5. What's our calling? Number one is the calling of an elder. What's her calling? Is the calling of a witness. What's her calling? Is the calling of a partaker. What's her calling? Is the calling of a willing servant. What's her calling? Is the calling of a servant with a ready mind, ready anytime, ready for everything, ready for any assignment, ready for any work, ready day or night. A servant with a ready mind. What's her assignment? And what's her calling? It's the calling of a servant that is not lording it over the congregation. What's her calling? 
is according to be an example examples to the flock look at that one by one as we seek about our calling and our character it tells us in verse 1 it says the elders which are among you i exhort who am also an elder we have the calling of an elder by the way what does that mean an elder there are some people that think they automatically become elders because of their age they are older than most people in the congregation and they want people to recognize them as elders and the bible even say that's what they all say that there are elders in the church and so you have these self-appointed people because of their chronological age number of years they think that means you are an elder who's an elder let the word of god clear it up for us we're looking at uh, acts of the apostles chapter 20 acts chapter 20 and i'm reading here from verse 17 and then from that verse 17 we go to verse 28 acts of the apostles chapter 20 and we're reading from verse 17 in verse 17 here is what it says it says and from my letters he sent to ephesus and he called the elders of the church he called the elders of the church and then he goes on to verse 18 and when they were come he began to talk to them see what he told them in verse 28 he's talking to the elders take each therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the holy ghost has made you overseers the people that were called elders in verse 17 that they called together they are now called overseers to feed the church of god which he has purchased with his own blood they are overseers therefore they oversee therefore they supervise and therefore they also feed the church of god they know the state of the flock they know the might of the flock they know the needs of the of the flock and because of that they take the appropriate word and they feed them and they teach them and they train them and they give them responsibilities he calls them elders he calls them overseers so it's not because of age it's because of calling we're looking in at titus chapter one and we're reading from verse five titus chapter one reading from verse five it says in verse five for this cause let i thee in courage that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and to ordain elders elders are people who are ordained elders are people who are appointed elders are people who are put in position to ordain elders in every city as i have ordained thee and it's not going to show titus the qualification of the elders that he must ordain appoint and here you'll not find age you'll not find marital status that is whether married or not is the not most is not the most important thing if the person is married of course he will have the proper the proper understanding of what marriage for leaders ought to be if any man be blameless the husband of one wife having faithful children children not um, you know people who are grown up and are already married but having faithful children when those children are still under your roof not accused of riot or unruly for a bishop must be blameless the people he called elders that titles was to appoint they are here now called a bishop he must be blameless as the steward of god is also called steward 
not self-willed, not soon angry, and not giving to wine, no striker, not giving to filthy lucre, for, but a lover of, of hospitality, and lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. As he talks about the calling, he talks about the character. There will be people who have the grace of God in their lives to be sober. There will be people who have the grace of God in their lives. They have been justified and they are just. There will be people that have gone further, deeper into Christian experiences. They are holy and sanctified. And there are people who are temperate. That's their character. Look at verse 9. Holding forth. Uh, the word holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught elders are not just people who come to the church and as members of the church look at their age they're in their 70s they're in their 80s they got converted last month but you know they're already 80 and because of that automatically they become elders no not at all not at all they're people who have been taught in the word and they have been appointed either as a pastor, a teacher of the word, and because of that, or a superseer, and they are holding fast the faithful word as they have been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine but to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Elders are those who know the word of God thoroughly. And they're able to convince other people, persuade other people, compel other people to obey the word of God. Number two, a witness. Come back to First Peter chapter 5. And I'm reading here from verse 1. The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. A witness that's what the Lord has called us to he calls us so that we can be witnesses and he tells us what it means and who are the people as he talks about the calling of a witness he also talks about the character of the witness we're looking at Acts chapter 5 and I'm reading from verse 30 Acts chapter 5 we're reading from verse 30 in verse 30, here is what he says, and here is Peter talking that God of her fathers restored Jesus. He died, he suffered, and we are witnesses, a witness of the sufferings of Christ, whom he slew and hanged on a tree. Him God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior will witness his suffering and will witness his sacrifice and that's because the father has appointed him a prince and a savior for to give repentance to israel and forgiveness of sins and we are his witnesses we are his witnesses we saw him betrayed we saw him crucified we saw him killed slain he died. We saw him after the resurrection. And he committed the work into our hands. And we are witnesses. That's a calling. We come to witness that he is the Savior. We come to witness that he is the one to redeem and to give forgiveness to everyone that repents. But look at the character. As he talks about the calling, he talks about the character. Verse 32. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so also is the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey him, we obey him, because he is the one the Father has appointed. Number one is an elder, an overseer, a pastor, a preacher, and someone who knows the word of God, who has been taught the word of God, and is appointed and ordained to teach the people of God. Number two is a witness, a witness that is obedient to the Lord. Number three is a partaker. We're coming back to 
First uh, Peter chapter 5 verse 1 the elders which are among you I exhort was am an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed he's talking about the future because of the experience of the present he says I am a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed that's future the glory is coming the reward is coming and because I'm a partaker now I will be a partaker at that time what does that mean what will see a partaker of today that gave him the assurance he'll be a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed Hebrews chapter 12 verse 10 Hebrews chapter 12 verse 10 for they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure talking about about our fathers earthly fathers but he talking about God for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness without holiness no man shall save the Lord and Peter said I'm a partaker I'm an elder I'm a witness every witness and every every elder must be a partaker a partaker of his holiness and that is what will give the assurance that he'll be a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed verse 14 for the peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the lord it tells us in second peter chapter one second peter chapter one verse three according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye may be partakers of the divine nature partakers of the divine nature and the apostle peter said i'm going to be a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed how do i know that that is still future because and be partaker at the present time of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through loss as he talks about the calling he talks about the character what's the character holiness because it's a partaker of his holiness and then what's the character is a kind of character that is free from corruption having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lost and then is a willing servant we're coming back to first peter chapter five and i'm reading from verse two first peter chapter five verse two feed the flock of god which which is among you taking the oversight thereof taking the oversight thereof so that you know the members of the flock taking the oversight thereof so that you are interacting with the members of your church your local church you are interacting with the youths and with the children that God has raised you up to lead. You are interacting with the women that God has raised you up to lead. And you take the oversight thereof. You supervise everyone. And you supervise their lives. And their situation and their state is not strange to you. And they are not hiding themselves from you either. Then it goes on in that verse 2. And it says, not by constraint, but willingly. A willing servant. That's what you ought to be. It's not like uh, somebody is forcing us to do it. It's not like somebody is uh, compelling us against our will. But we are willing servants. It tells us in First Corinthians chapter 9. 
1 Corinthians chapter 9, reading from verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we're reading from verse 16. It tells us in verse 16, For though I be free from all men, though I be free from all men, it's saying that there's nobody forcing him to do anything. The Lord has set him free. The Lord has liberated him. But even though he is free from all men, yet have I made my serv myself servant unto all. Make myself servant unto all, for that I might gain the more. I want to get them saved. I want to get them into the kingdom of God. And then he tells us in verse 20, uh, verse 20 says, and unto the Jews became I as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law as under the law. I compare myself, I school myself, I'm temperate in all things. And he says that I might gain them that are under the law to them that are without law, as without law, not being uh, without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things unto all men, that by all means I might save some. You see that? A willing servant. And so you're always looking at the field. You're always looking at the people. And you're always looking at the opportunity to get so saved. Come back to that verse 16. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, a willing servant, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. A willing servant. In Second Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. You're not being compelled, but you are giving yourself freely and fully and willingly. Second Corinthians chapter 8, reading from verse 3. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves. Not compelled, not constrained, they were willing of themselves. Verse 5, and this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord. They committed themselves fully, totally, completely unto the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Number one, the elders, bishops, teachers, pastors, they are referred to as elders, witness of his suffering, understanding Jesus died on the cross, and they are partakers of the glory that shall be revealed because they are partakers of the experience of the child of God now, and they are willing servants, number five, servants of a ready mind, of a ready mind. It tells us in the latter part of First Peter chapter 5, First Peter chapter 5, latter part of verse 2. Not for filthy lookers, not for filthy looker, that is, not for money, not for material gain, not what they can get out of the provision in the church or from the members of the church, but of a ready mind. But of a ready mind. Those are the people that have the mind of Christ ready in Philippians chapter 2 Philippians chapter 2 reading from verse 3 let nothing be done through strife of vain glory 
We're not striving for money. We're not striving for material gain. We're not striving because of what I can get out of it, what you can get out of it. I'm laboring more than him. And he's getting more money than I am getting. Not like that. And not for vain glory, not for pride. I know what I can do. I know my strength. I know my power. And I know that all these things they're giving me, they're not even up to what I am rendering, not for being glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own thing. Look not every man on his own thing. Whatever is our commission, whatever is our calling, whatever is our area of work, we're not looking at our area and we're not saying, when are they going to give us what we deserve? I are they giving that group and that section more than they're giving us? We will not have that. We must fight it out. If it takes routing, we're going to riot. Uh -uh. The people who have the calling of God are not like that. They have a ready mind to serve. And it says, well, they have this mind, uh, let each esteem other better than themselves. And it tells us in verse 5, let this mind be you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Not for filthy looker. Number 6, not being uh, as lords over God's heritage. We're coming to First Peter chapter 5. And we're reading from verse 3. Neither has been lords over God's heritage. No, we're called servants. And we're to serve the people of God. And we're to lower ourselves and hide whatever is making us proud and pompous and being above the people of God not being as large over God's heritage. A hey, look at um, Third John, reading from verse nine. Third John, verse nine. The people that wear their skill on their face, and they wear their qualification on their face with their dress, and they carry themselves as if. They go on commanding, compelling everybody in the church, and you must bow to them. That's not the attitude of Christ in Third John, verse 9. It tells us in verse 9, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Don't come here. We don't want a personality clash. We're already here. We're exalted and we're high and we're preeminent there. So John, stay where you are. He loved it to have preeminence among them. Because of that, he received us not. And he was a man that carried himself with a negative authority, destructive authority. Look at verse 10. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he doeth, preaching against us with malicious words. Can you think of a leader? Can you think of an elder? Can you think of a preacher, a pastor in the church? You see malicious words, arrogant words, and words that will cut down other people other leaders and he says not and not content therewith neither does he himself receive the brethren and forbiddeth them that would he forbiddeth them that would is always going around and is carrying this a great you know a pompous personality and those who will receive the other preachers of the same truth, it will, come, it will forbid them and cast them out of the church. What an authority. What a person that has the attitude of being a lord over the people of God. And let's uh, come back to First Peter chapter 5. And we're reading from verse 3. First Peter chapter 5, we're looking at verse 3. 
neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. Examples to the flock. That's who we are, and that's what we ought to be. Look at First Thessalonians chapter 2, reading from verse 7. First Thessalonians chapter 2. We're reading from verse 7. We're to be examples to the flock. Example of the Christ, of Christian grace. Example of Christian character. Example of Christian humility. In First Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 7. But were gentle among you. That's been an example. Even as a nurse cherishes a children. That's been an example. So being affectionately desirous of you, we well, were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only. Willing teachers, willing preachers, willing pastors, willing overseers, but also our own souls because you were dear unto us. An example of hospitality. An example of love, an example of caring for the church. For we remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day because we will not be chargeable unto any of you. An example of sacrificial labor. We will not be chargeable unto any of you. It's not that, okay, this one is going on in the church. I have a this, a card. I have this business. What can I have? After all, if you are going to have uh, somebody who will take over that kind of job and supply this and supply that, the force says something should come to a person like me because who are the people laboring? And we are the people teaching the people. Uh-uh. We will not be chargeable to any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses. And God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves from you that believe. We behaved ourselves in the proper way because we are examples to the flock. Point number two now. Our commission and commitment to freely feed the lambs. We're coming back to your first Peter. And we're reading chapter 5, the first line in verse 2. Feed the flock of God which is among you. Feed the flock of God which is among you. Remember, he's talking to elders, he's talking to preachers, he's talking to pastors. And there's a pastor there, there's a pastor there, a pastor in another place, and he's talking to all of them. Wherever you are, in whatever congregation you are, prepare to give the bread of life to the congregation where you are. And that's why he says to the flock of God, which is among you. Everyone understands that that means we are to teach the word of God. We are to preach the word of God. But why are we doing that? Because man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God shall man live. How do you understand then what we are to do? Number one, feed with the word. Feed with the word. You're feeding the church of God. You're feeding the people of God with the word. You must know the word yourself. The word of salvation for those who are not saved. The word of sanctification. You're very clear about it for those who need to be sanctified. And the word of healing for those who need to be healed. The word of deliverance for those who need to be delivered. Feed the church with the word of God. Look at um, chapter 4 of Matthew. Matthew chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 4. Feed with the word, but he answered and said, It is written, man shall not labor by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth 
out of the mouth of God. Out of the mouth of God. Out of the mouth of God. Underline that in your Bible. Why? As to take the whole Bible, the Bible records what unbelievers said. Like what Pharaoh said, who is that God? That's not word out of the mouth of God. It's recorded for us to understand. There are people that do not believe God that also spoke. And then you understand also the words that Satan spoke. And he said, is Job serving you for nothing? Take this away from him. And then it will cost you to your face. That's not a word from the mouth of God. That's a word from the mouth of the devil. And then when Jeremiah said, I will not make mention of his name anymore. I'm tired. They're not listening to me. They're not hearing me. I will not take his word in my mouth and talk to anybody anymore. That's not the word coming out of the mouth of God that came out of the mouth of Jeremiah. And as you go through the Bible, you'll find the words that came out of the mouth of Herod. The word that came out of the mouth of uh, Nebuchadnezzar and the word that came out of the Pharisees in their tradition. But if you are to feed the church of God, if you are to feed the people of God, you feed them with the word that comes out of the mouth of God. Number two, exalt the word above everyone and above yourself. Exalt the word above everyone and above yourself. We're looking at Psalm 138, Psalm 138, and I'm reading from verse 2. Psalm 138, verse 2. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name. For thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. As you come to the local church, as you come to the central church, have that same attitude that we all together were to make the atmosphere conducive to feeding the church with the word of God. And whatever else we do in the church, you exalt the word above every other thing because even God exalts the word, magnifies the word above his name. Number three, it means to preach the word at every opportunity to preach the word. And there may be things going on in our community, in our state, in our nation. And there may be things going on that maybe people are talking about. There are some people who are kind of uh, committed to football. And when a uh, football is going on uh, in the community, that, that's what they talk about. And then uh, this uh, nation is playing against that other nation when they come uh, to church. That's what they're talking about. They're talking about football. They're talking about game. There are other times that some other things are happening uh, in your community. And there are people that will come on Sunday. And they use precious pulpit time to talk about, about politics, about this, about that. But you know what we are to do? Every time, every opportunity, if we are to feed the flock of God, we we'll preach the word. Number one, feed of the word. Number two, exalt the word. Number three, preach the word. It's in Second Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 2. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort without long suffering and doctrine. Doctrine. Don't sweep doctrine under the carpet. Bring it out. Teach the people. Show the people the doctrine, the word of God. Preach the word. Number four is to speak the word only. Underline the word only. Speak the word only. Not the word and opinions. Not the word and tradition. 
not the world and opinions, not the world and denominational dogma. Speak the word only. That's how we're going to feed the church of God. And the church of God will not have the difficulty of uh, sifting, of saying, which one am I going to take now? Is that opinion? Is that Bible doctrine? Is that tradition? Is that Bible doctrine? Is that denominational dogma? Or is it the word of God? They will not have that confusion if we speak the word only. The word only on the line. We're looking at Matthew chapter 8, and I'm reading from verse 8. Matthew chapter 8, verse 8. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only. Speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. That's how healing comes. Speak the word only. And our hearers will be saved. That's how salvation comes. Speak the word only. And believers will be sanctified. Sanctify them through thy truth. But when we mix uh, ideologies and opinions and all that. And people do not know what to believe and what to take. That's how they are not saved. That's how they are not healed. That's how they are not sanctified. And that's how they do not have the blessings of God. Speak the word only. Teach the word, teach the word, teach the word. At every opportunity, you're teaching the word. That's how we feed the flock of God. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 18. Acts chapter 18, and I'm reading from verse 11. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 18, and we're reading from verse 11. In verse 11, here is what the word of God is saying. In verse 11, and he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. He didn't run out of subject, teaching the word of God among them. As you have the whole Bible in your hand from Genesis to Revelation, you shouldn't miss any time or lose any opportunity. There is enough of the word of God in the Bible. And there is enough of the teaching that the Lord has given us. And you teach the word at every opportunity. But then you keep the word. You keep the word. Because if you are teaching and you are not keeping, if you are telling other people to do it, but you don't have the grace to do it, the strength and the power to do it, who will believe? They will say, that's a great uh, idea. That's a great teaching. But you know, even the teacher himself is not able to practice what he teaches. Look at Luke chapter 11, verse 28. Luke 11, verse 28. And he said, Ye rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Blessed are they that teach the word of God and keep it and then declare the word boldly. De declare the word boldly. You know, as you talk, people can tell from the tone of your voice, from the look of your eyes, from the body language, whether you are timid or courageous, whether you are sure or uncertain, whether you are persuaded yourself or you are doubting, and whether you are speaking boldly, courageously, affirming the truth, or you are just reading it and you glue your eyes to the book or to your notes. You are afraid to look at the people. You are to speak to the people. And you are to help them to understand that this is the real thing. You shouldn't be intimidated. You should preach that word, declare that word boldly. We're coming to Acts chapter 4. Acts of the Apostles chapter 4. We're reading from verse 29. If you lack the boldness, then pray. The Lord will make us bold in Jesus' name. 
verse 29 and now lord behold their threat news and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they speak thy word with all boldness they speak thy word understand you might be the only agent of god that can speak to them for their salvation you might be the only minister they will listen to and they'll get sanctified you might be the only one they listen to and they will have what will qualify them for heaven that's the reason why you will speak with all boldness look at verse 31 and when they had preached the place was shaking where they were assembled together that was real praying and they were all filled with the holy ghost and they speak the word of god tell me how with boldness the lord will do that in our lives in jesus name one feed the flock with the word two exalt the word before the flock three preach the word at all seasons to the floor four speak the word only the word only underlined teach number five teach the word and teach that word confidently six keep the word obey that word because if the preacher cannot obey the word are we sure that the members will be able to obey him? And then number seven, declare the word boldly. Number eight, give all that you have to the word. Give all you have to the word. You know, sometimes you think you have little physical strength. And then you are managing the strength. What are you managing the strength for? It is the best thing you can do in life. And this is the glorious thing the Lord has called you to. Give yourself to it. Abandon yourself to it. And preach the word with all the strength you have. All the skill you have. All the ability you have. All the knowledge you have. Give everything you have. And preach the word. The Lord will honor your ministry. Acts chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 4. Acts chapter 6, verse 4. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. We'll give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Acts chapter 8, verse 4. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. They lost all. They were chased away from their houses. They were driven away from Jerusalem. And they were scattered abroad everywhere, almost homeless. But then they forgot what they had lost and they gave themselves to preach the word with all confidence and courage. The Lord will help you. And then you exemplify the word. Exemplify the word. Whatever you are teaching, exemplify it. Show sure, this is how it can be done. This is how it ought to be done. That's how to feed the flock of God in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Remember them which have the rule over you. Who are those elders? bishops pastors teachers of the word who have spoken unto you the word of god whose faith follow the teaching faith and they're living by faith they're standing by faith and they're helping other people to stand by faith whose faith follow considering the end of their conversation exemplify the word suffer cheerfully for the word's sake suffer cheerfully for the word's sake should in case the preaching of the word brings any affliction any persecution any suffering take it 
and accept that. I say, praise the Lord. That's the word is working. You understand the word. Even though they may disagree with the word, yet they understand. That's why they are receiving that persecution. You suffer cheerfully for the word. We're looking at Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, reading from verse 40. Reading from verse 40. Acts chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 40. It says unto him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and had beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. They commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus. Whosoever commandment you obey, you show that you are a servant and a slave of that whosoever. The Lord had commanded them, and he had said that they will teach all things. He had commanded them. That commandment had come to them, and they were carrying out the commandment, which means that they accepted Christ as their master. They accepted Christ as their Lord. Another authority now came, another personality now came, another pressure group now came and said, whatever commandment you have before now, forget all about that. We now command you that you must not preach in this name. And remember, whoever you obey, that's your master, that's your Lord. Whoever you obey, you are going to spend the rest of eternity with your master and with your Lord. If it's Christ, you spend eternity with him. If it's the Pharisees who are opposed to Christ, you spend eternity with them. Now they commanded them, don't speak in that name. Look at verse 41. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple, and in every house, deceased not, disturbed not, to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was their master. And so they obeyed their master. Jesus Christ is our Lord and master. And so we obey our Lord and master. Any other authority we don't recognize. Any other commander or, co or captain, we don't understand. Any other compelling counsel, we don't, we don't uh, agree to. We're going to obey the Lord every time, all the time, in Jesus' name. Feed the flock of God. What's the word? Exalt the word above every other sin in your life, every other sin in your family, every other sin in the local church. Preach the word in season and out of season and speak the word only. Don't add tradition, don't add opinion, don't add the ideas of men. Teach the word and teach confidently and teach courageously keep the word obey the word be ye doers of the word and not hearers only because if we did that we'll be deceiving ourselves declare the word boldly courageously with no timidity or fear of man give yourself everything you've got to the word be fully committed exemplify the word and suffer cheerfully for the word. Point number three now, the compensation and crowning of focused and fruitful leaders. The compensation and crowning of focused and fruitful leaders. We're looking at First Peter chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 1. First Peter chapter 5, 
verse 1. The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. A partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Verse 4, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Amen. What's her compensation? We're preaching the word. We're serving the church. We're evangelizing. We're defying the church. We're planting churches here and there. And we're counseling. And we're helping people to grow in the Lord. And we give ourselves unreservedly to the ministry of the world. What's our compensation then? What's the commendation? What's the reward? What a lot of things. Number one, God walking with us. Even here in this life, as we serve the Lord unreservedly, we have the compensation of God walking with us. Mark chapter 16. Verse 20, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord walking with them. What a privilege, what an experience. The Lord walking with them and confirming the word was signs following. He will go with you. He will walk with you. You'll not be walking like a lone ranger. You'll not be walking like an orphan. His power will go with you. Amen. His confirmation will go with you. Amen. And his miracle might and miracle ministry will go with you in Jesus' name. Amen. What's our compensation? As we faithfully declare the word of God, number one, God walking with us. Number two, the spirit with Christ interceding for us. The Spirit, the Holy Ghost, was Christ interceding for us in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, reading from verse 26. Romans chapter 8, verse 26, likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities. As you go out and you proclaim the word, as you go to the local church, and you proclaim the word. Here is the benefit. And here is the uh, compensation the Lord gives. That the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, helps your infirmity. For we know not what we should pray for. As we ought, but the Spirit maketh intercession for us. With groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the heart knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints, and of course for the servants, according to the will of God. That's the privilege, that's the advantage, that we're serving the Lord, and he takes whatever problems might remain in your own personal life, he takes that to the Heavenly Father, and he makes intercession for you. Look at verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again. Who even at the who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Maketh intercession for us. You remember? Joshua went to the battlefield, and then Moses was sitting on, uh, was standing, and whenever he lifted up his hand, and the rod of God, Joshua will be winning, conquering, overcoming. But whenever his hand went down, then Joshua will be losing the battle until Aaron and all came. 
and he lifted up the hand permanently and uh, the victory was permanent and complete but now it's not Moses interceding for us it's not all and it's not Aaron and it's not uh, Abraham that interceded for Sodom and Gomorrah and it's not Daniel or Nehemiah interceding for Israel it's the Lord Jesus Christ himself and it's the Holy Ghost himself interceding for us we have the victory in Jesus' name. What's the compensation? As we're serving the Lord unreservedly, God walking with us and confirming the word, or signs following the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, with Christ interceding for us. Any more advantage? Any more um, compensation? Number three, Christ's abiding presence. Christ's abiding presence. That's the, that's the compensation that he told us is going to be with us as we go out and do what he has called us to do. Matthew chapter 28, and we're reading from verse 20. Matthew chapter 28, reading from verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And while we're doing that faithfully, while we're doing that unreservedly, while we're doing that courageously, while we're doing that boldly, it says, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And the church said, Amen. It says, He'll be with us, He'll not leave us alone. And so we boldly say, The Lord is my helper he has said he will never leave us he'll never leave you hebrews chapter 13 hebrews 13 i'm reading from verse 5 hebrews chapter 13 verse 5 let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have for he has said i will never leave you nor forsake you so that we may boldly say the Lord is my helper. The Lord will be your helper. And I will not fear what man shall do unto me. You will not fear what man shall do unto you in Jesus' name. And then the more compensation, we have the comfort, the guidance, and the teaching of the Holy Ghost. We have the comfort, and we have the guidance, and we have the teaching of the Holy Ghost. We're looking at John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Obedience to the Lord pays. Obedience to the Lord will bring all these uh, present, uh, uh, present compensations unto us. It tells us in verse 15. John chapter 14. If ye love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, while we're keeping those commandments of Christ, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. The Holy Ghost will never leave you. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, neither knoweth him, but she know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Verse 26, For the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. He will not allow you to be ignorant. He will not allow you to be confused. As you obey the Lord, he says, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. Whatever you ought to remember, you will not forget. Your victory, you will not forget. Your triumph, you will not forget. The power that you ought to manifest, you will not forget. And whatsoever I have said unto you, he will be with you. Look at chapter 16, verse 13. Chapter 16, verse 13. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come. He will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of himself, 
but whatsoever he shall hear that shall he speak and he will show you things to come he'll give us as we obey him he'll give us as we're carrying out his work he'll give us the comfort the guidance and the teaching of the holy ghost number five he'll give us the present ministry of angels not future the present ministry of angels hebrews chapter 1 reading from verse 13 hebrews chapter 1 verse 13 but to which of the angels said he at any time sit on my right hand until i make thine enemies thy footstool are they not all ministry spirits those angels sent forth to minister to them who shall be heirs of salvation his angels at the present time will minister unto you in the night they will stay around you in the day they will go before you any danger they will cancel the danger in jesus name that's our present compensation look at acts of the apostles chapter 12 and i'm reading from verse 7 acts of the apostles chapter 12 reading from verse 7 and behold the angel of the lord came upon him this is peter and a light shined in the prison and he smote peter on the side and raised him up saying arise up quickly and the chase fell off from his hands like it will happen to you every time and the angel said unto him gird thyself and bind on thy sandals and so he did and he said unto him cast thy garment about thee and follow me and he went out and followed him and wist not that it was true he thought he was dreaming which was done by the angel but thought he saw a vision a vision of the night when they were past the first and the second watch they came unto the iron gate that leads into the city and they opened to them of his own accord those gates will open those iron bars will be broken and the iron door will always open before you in jesus name the key is in the hand of the angel and those angels will lead you out to safety and when and they went out and passed through on through one street and forthwith the angel departed from him and when peter was come to himself he said now i know of a surety that the lord has sent his angel and has delivered me out of the hand of herod and from all the expectation of the people of the jews you will have the present ministry of angels as compensation and then we'll have the compensation of the spirit dwelling inside us the spirit dwelling inside us romans chapter 8 reading from verse 11 romans chapter 8 verse 11 but if the spirit of him that traced up jesus from the dead dwell in you the spirit so powerful to roll away the stone the spirit so powerful that all those uh, girls were blown down and they fell on their faces the spirit so powerful that jesus was brought outside from out of the grave if that spirit of him that traced up jesus from the dead dwell 
in you. Where is the Spirit of God now? I say, where is the Spirit of God now? In you. He that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead shall also, shall also, shall also quicken your mortal bodies by the Spirit that dwelleth in you. When he quickens your mortal body, all those weaknesses and infirmities will vanish away in Jesus' name. Amen. Number seven, sufficient provision for all your needs. Sufficient provision for all your needs. You will not lack anymore. Serve the Lord and look at the promise he's going to fulfill in Mark chapter 10. Reading from verse 28. Mark chapter 10, verse 28. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and will follow thee. Jesus answered and said, Verily, I say unto you, There is no man that has left house, brethren, sisters, father, mother, wife, children, lands, for my sake, and the gospels, but, for Stachy, tell me, tell me, tell me, you will receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses, brethren, sisters, mothers, children, lands with persecution and in the world to come eternal life. Somebody shout Amen. Amen. You have earthly rewards, you have heavenly rewards. First Peter chapter five. First Peter chapter five. I'm reading from verse four. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, he shall receive a crown of glory that fades not away. Number one, compensation for today, God walking with us. The spirit with Christ is interceding for us. Christ, presence, abiding, in us the comfort the guidance the teaching of the holy ghost the present ministry of angels the quickening spirit the healing spirit dwelling in us sufficient provision for all our needs and now to crown it all crowns of glory crowns of honor and crowns of future splendor. Crowns. When he talks of crowns, he's talking about a lot of things. Look at Psalm 103. Psalm 103. I'm reading from verse 4. Who redeems thy life from destruction. I was waiting for your amen. And crowns thee in this present life and crowns thee at this present time and crowns thee while you're serving and believing him and crowned thee with loving kindness and tender mercies who satisfies thy mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed as the eagles psalm 132 we're reading from verse 18 psalm 100 and 32, we're reading from verse 18. His enemies were like clothes for shame. Your enemies were like clothes for shame. But upon himself shall his crown flourish. Upon yourself, your crown will flourish. Even now, in this present time, Honor will crown you. Amen. Glory will crown you. Amen. 
the goodness of the Lord will crown you. Isaiah chapter 62, reading from verses 3 and 4. Isaiah chapter 62, verse 3. Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and the royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hephzibah, and thy land Beulah. For the Lord delighteth in thee. The Lord is happy with you. The Lord delights in you. And thy land shall be married. You will not lack all these blessings of God in Jesus' name. Now on earth, crowns of glory, crowns of splendor, crowns of honor, crowns of exaltation and then when we cross to the other side a glorious crown waiting for you in jesus name Amen. revelation chapter 3 reading from verse 11 revelation chapter 3 verse 11 behold i come quickly hold fast hold that fast which thou hast that no man take your crown no man will take your crown. No man will take your reward. No man will take your compensation. Everything the Lord has promised, He will grant unto you in Jesus' name. Him that overcometh, will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God. And the name of the city of my God which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write my, and I will write upon him my new name. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that has an ear to hear, anyone there having ears to hear? Have you heard? I said, have you heard of the blessings you are going to receive? Have you heard of the compensation is going to give you? I said, have you heard? You have heard they will all be yours in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. You have heard of all the blessings of God that he said he will give. You have heard of our commission. You have heard of her calling. You have heard of her character. You have heard of her commitment. And you have heard of what he says he's going to do. The compensation, the crowning for those who are focused, for those who are fruitful, for those who are feeding the flock of God, and for those who are fervent and faithful unto the Lord. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord. Remember. He wants you to be a real elder, a real elder that is fervent in the work of the Lord, a real witness of the Lord Jesus Christ, a partaker of his nature and a partaker of his holiness. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. Tell the Lord that all these things you receive he has called us. He has commissioned us. And we're going to stay by his commission. And we're going to accept the commission. And we're going to live by that commission. And we're going to do it unreservedly. We're going to do it with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind. It's the greatest work anyone can do on earth. The greatest commitment anyone can have on earth is the greatest assignment anyone can have on this side of heaven, greater than any other domestic sin, earthly sin, physical sin, natural sin. 
give yourself to it unreservedly. Underline your, your calling. Underscore your calling. An elder, the real elder, righteous elder, the real elder that people can tell in your character. You have the word, you're holding on to the word. You're living out the word. The life is clean, clear, holy, righteous. Be a witness to the Lord Jesus Christ, his sacrifice, his suffering. His substitution, what he did to save sinners, be a witness, a courageous witness. A faithful witness, an obedient witness. A scriptural witness, holy, sanctified, committed witness, be a partaker of the holiness of God, be a partaker of the nature of God that's your calling that's your character you are marked by holiness you are distinguished by righteousness you are characterized by the very nature of Christ, a partaker of his nature, a partaker of his holiness, be a willing servant. Not because anybody is compelling you. you. Don't feel constrained. Let there be the freedom from within. The freedom from your heart. To sacrificially serve the Lord. Not cutting corners. Not doing a shoddy work. Not hurrying over the work. And then the work is not done thoroughly. Be a willing servant. Willingly sacrificing everything. Willingly giving up yourself. Willingly committing yourself to what the Lord has called you to do. No reservation, no looking back, no conserving what you have, which you should have given. 
the willing servant with a ready mind. With a ready mind. You're ready at all times. Have a talk the challenge might be you're ready however heavy the assignment might be you're ready a ready mind not for material gain no covetousness no greed, and you will not lord it over God's heritage. You will not make yourself a nuisance, driving this and compelling this and commanding that. You're not forcing the people of God. You're not forcing God's heritage. You're not forcing the flock of God. You're not overbearing, overdriving. Pray that the Lord will give you the grace to remember and be gentle, be meek. Be loving as he knows cherishes a children that God will give you such a pastoral heart that Jesus meek and lowly yet truthful and faithful And you'll be an example to the flock in your life, an example of righteousness, an example of temperance, an example of sobriety, an example of holiness, an example of a committed, dedicated, diligent teacher of the world. Be an example. And preach the word. Preach the word. Teach the word. Commit yourself afresh. To exalting the word above all things around you. Speak the word only. No politics on the pulpit. No sports on the pulpit. No social media rumors on the pulpit. Preach the word and exalt that word above every other thing. Above your friends, above members of the family. Don't look at faces before you preach. Preach the word. Whoever needs repentance will have to repent. Whoever needs restoration will have to be restored. And preach that word boldly, courageously, persuasively.
exemplify the word. Sure, it is possible to live by the word, whatever the challenge. Sure, it is possible to stand firmly on the revealed word. And if you have to suffer, if it so happens that suffering comes because of the word, don't leave the word. Don't abandon the pulpit. Don't change the message. Don't apologize for the truth. Keep on standing. Suffering cheerfully, if need be, because of the word. And you know there is compensation. What a great privilege that God himself, God Almighty, the creator of the heavens and the earth, that God will walk with you. Tell the Lord, you appreciate that, his partnership in ministry, his provision for ministry, and the fact that he will not leave you, he will not forsake you, he will abide with you while you're doing his work. Praise him for that. Appreciate him for that. Compensation. Reward. Commendation. Even before the final crowning. The Spirit interceding for you. It was a great privilege. Christ interceding for you. What a great privilege. And the abiding presence of Christ, that's part of the reward here on earth. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And the comfort of the Holy Ghost. The guidance of the Holy Ghost. The teaching of the Holy Ghost. That's what he has promised. Thank him for that. Praise him for that. And as the present ministry of angels, trust him. No challenge will come that will not take you through. There's the indwelling of the Spirit that quickens a mortal body. Sufficient provision for all our needs crowns of glory crowns of honor crowns of splendor now and after we leave this earth hold on hold fast don't look back don't surrender Yourself to the enemy. Keep on keeping on. This promise will be yes and amen in your life. In Jesus' name we pray. And the happy people of God said, Amen. The believing servants of God said, Amen. What God has said, He will do.
and what you have heard, you will practice and you will do in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you for this hour of teaching, this hour of revelation. We thank you for everything we have heard. We are praying, O oh Lord, we will be doers of the word in Jesus' name. Amen. All those titles you have called us, all those names you have called us, all those symbolic things you have made known unto us that we are, I pray, Lord, in a very definite and real sense, will be like that in Jesus' name. Amen. The power to carry it out, the strength to carry it out, the skill to carry it out, the grace to carry it out, the enlightenment to carry it out, and the light that goes in our way that we carry it out with faith without wavering. We pray you grant to everyone in Jesus' name. This word you have given us will never leave our mouth. We'll preach the word. We'll teach the word. We'll exalt the word. We'll speak the word only. We'll spread the word everywhere. We'll publish the word everywhere. We'll labor in the word fervently and faithfully in Jesus' name. We pray that in season and out of season, the courage to keep on standing by the word and proclaiming the word and preaching the word, declaring it and declaring it boldly, courageously, you grant to everyone in Jesus' name. We're sure that you will not fail us. We're sure you will not be unfaithful to us. You are faithful, God. You are ever faithful. And all the promises you have given, we know they are going to be yes and amen in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. As your servants go, your sons and daughters, as they go and they work for you, I pray according to your promise and according to what you've done for the apostles of old, your power will go with them. Amen. The Lord will be working with every one of us. And Lord, I pray that the intercession of the Holy Ghost and the intercession of Christ will avail for everyone in Jesus' name. The mighty presence of Christ in us when he has said he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. And so we can boldly say the Lord is our helper. We will not fear what man will do. Lord, I pray the hand of evil men will not touch your people. The hand of evil people will not touch your people. Amen. You will surround us. You will, supply, you will supply every need of our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord Jesus, we know you are still interceding for us. Holy Ghost, we know you are still interceding for us. And you abide inside us. Every weakness is cancelled. Every infirmity is cancelled. For the spirit that raised up Jesus Christ abides and dwells in us, it will quicken our mortal body. Amen. New strength, Amen. new vigor, Amen. new health, Amen. new ability, Amen. new dynamism Amen. in every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. All our needs you will supply. Amen. All our prayers you will answer. Amen. Lord, we lay everything down again at the altar. And we're asking, oh Lord, we'll never look back. Amen. We will not cringe. Amen. We will not crumble. Amen. We will not forsake the world. Amen. You will crown our efforts with success in Jesus' name. Amen. Crowns of glory for your people. Amen. Crowns of honor for your people. Amen. Crowns of splendor for your people. Amen. Joy, Amen. happiness, Amen. satisfaction, Amen. fulfillment Amen. in the work of the Lord for everyone in Jesus' name. Amen. Whatever present need of your problem as you are serving the Lord, the Lord supply abundantly. Amen. And the Lord give you all the good desires of your heart in Jesus' name. Amen. The solution you are seeking for that naughty, terrible problem, receive it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.